For new leapers, a warning, this contains some spoilers of the Quantum Leap episode Mirror Image and may contain spoilers of the Quantum Leap novel Search and Rescue. Now there's a novel concept. Melissa Crandall loves to write, well, whatever compels her. In the past, that's been fantasy, speculative fiction and non-fiction essays. But since February, Crandall has been involved in a non-fiction project that she's very excited about. Crandall's novels include media tie-ins for Star Trek and Earth 2, as well as an original fantasy, Weathercock. Crandall's short fiction has appeared in the e-zine Allegory, the collection Darling Wendy and Other Stories, and in Amos Gag, the Journal of Southern New Hampshire University. Her nonfiction work has appeared in Chicken Soup for the Soul, the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, NARHA Strides, and ASPCA's Animal Watch. Crandall is proud to be a regular participant in the exquisite project at Bill Library in Ledyard, Connecticut, and this year also had the pleasure to be involved in Connecticut Humanities, The CT Caper, a story written in serial form employing the talents of 12 writers and artists from across the state. Until recently, Crandall maintained a semi-regular blog, The Wild Ride, chronicling her experience as caretaker to her mother, who suffered from dementia. She still drops in from time to time to write about the grief process or provide a shoulder for someone who needs to vent about their experiences as a caretaker. It's important to realise that you're not alone. Crandall is as drawn to essays as she is to fiction and enjoys the difference between the two. Fiction allows her mind to soar, to imagine and bring to life the what ifs that plague her mind. Essays make her pause to stock, to examine in detail the events she chooses to report. Often the two styles are intertwined, the introspection of non-fiction bleeding over into speculation of fiction, the creativity of stories sparking a memory that, in turn, becomes an essay. It makes for a full, well-rounded meal. But, of course, Leapers will know Melissa Crandall best as the author of the Quantum Leap novel Search and Rescue. Hi, Melissa. Thanks for joining us today. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. You're more than welcome. I uh, just wanted to ask to start with, Quantum Leap's a really unique concept because you literally could come up with any situation you wanted to and turn it into a leap. Had you always wanted to write a survival or search and rescue story and decided to use Quantum Leap as the means to tell it? Or did it start with wanting to write something about Quantum Leap and then deciding to use survival or search and rescue as the theme? So in short, how did search and rescue come about? That is a really interesting question. Both scenarios that you put out sort of happened at the same time. Uh, I have a very good writer friend who I have been collaborating with for probably whew, 30 years or so. And it's we don't collaborate on anything for the rest of the world to see. It's just this own little universe that we write in for recreation. And we had done a story about a plane crash in the wilds of Canada and, you know, had just done this whole thing. So when I had the opportunity to do the Quantum Leap story, I kind of started looking at that story that she and I had done and talked to Ginger Buchanan and said, you know, what do you think of this idea? So I had to write up a whole outline of what the story would be about and uh, kind of stole some of the characters that Pam and I had shared and put them into Quantum Leap and massaged it around. And that's what happened. Fantastic. So how close was the final product to how you originally envisioned the story Search and Rescue? Pretty close. There were certain things I had to tweak and, and change, but it was pretty close to the way I had originally envisioned it. I, my, my real goal in the story was to really give Al an integral part in things. He always He's always important to whatever leap Sam does, but I really wanted to give him the opportunity to see what it was like to leap himself and to put him in a situation of real peril. Yeah, for sure. And I'm glad you mentioned Al because I can really tell it comes through in your writing really well that how much you love the Al character. Am I right in assuming that he's your favorite? Well, you know, that's interesting. When I started watching the show, I came to Quantum Leap kind of late in its run. A friend of mine recommended it to me and I started watching it and I got hooked. 
And when I first started, it, of course, Sam was my favorite character because Sam is who Sam is. And But as time goes on, when you're writing that character, he's just so good all the time. He's always trying his best. He's always putting his best foot forward, even if it, he doesn't always succeed. But Al is really interesting because Al is, is so flawed and so broken in many ways. And that makes him a very interesting character to play with. So uh, over time, I would have to say yes, that Al became my favorite character. Yes, he's my favorite too. And for very similar reasons as to what you said, he just, I think he adds some humanity to the to the show Whereas Sam's the overly good character who doesn't ever really seem to do anything wrong, whereas Al's the one who really makes the show feel human. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Sam is, he's the knight in shining armor to a real massive degree, and we don't really get to see a whole lot of maybe shades of gray with him, something that's a little darker. And Al's the everyman character, and I think because he's that it makes him easier for all of us to relate to. Sam is someone for us to aspire to, but Al is closer to who we really are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, to not spoil our listeners who haven't yet read the book too much, I'll just say there's a point where Al faces a near-death experience, apart from yeah. obviously the whole lot being a near-death experience. But um, <laughs> First of all, I think you picked a really interesting way for Al to find out what he looked like during this leap by, um, you know, being, uh, having the out-of-body experience looking down on himself. You, I don't think yes. we've ever seen that in Quantum Leap. <laughs> but uh, it really surprised me and actually upset me a little bit, but this is in a good way because you know something's good when you get emotional from it. Having written Al as quite a sad character who felt that he had very little to live for. And I really love that you made it that it was his friendship with Sam and not wanting Sam to fail and be stuck in time that really made Al want to cling to life. What brought on this poetic license and how did this side of Al evolve in your head? I don't think I can take a lot of credit for that. It, you know, the writing process is such a, it's an experience of evolution as you're doing it. And I did not set out to make Al this specific way. But when I was writing that scene, it just seemed perfectly natural with the character through the the series we got to see really how much he loves Sam and how much he would do for him. Oh, and absolutely. It just seemed natural to me that, that that's what would occur to him, that I may not be worth a lot because we all know he, he doesn't think very highly of himself uh, in a lot of respects. He's got a lot of insecurities because of his failed marriage and all the things that have happened to him. But knowing he's got this one true friend, and how can I let this one true friend fail? Because that's really what the show is about. Is, is In a lot of respects, it's a love story between Sam and Al. Oh, definitely. It, it really is the friendship between Sam and Al, which I think made the show what it was. You must have done a great deal of research about Native American culture in order to incorporate some of their customs and beliefs, like Chris's grandfather being able to see each person's spirit animal and having talismans which can help you tap into them and trying to use the behavior of the animals to help navigate through the wilderness, all those sort of things. How did you learn all of this really interesting information and how long do you think the research took? The Native American research didn't take a very long time at all because it was, a lot of it was stuff I already knew because I've always been interested in the idea of talismans and animal totems and I'm very connected to the natural world. I, I like being around animals and observing animals and, and that connection that we make with them. The part of the book I had to do a lot of research on was Canada and you know, British Columbia in particular and where could I have this plane go down? And, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, I'm going to have this plane go down. Well, then you have to go, well, how are they going to find it? So I actually contacted the folks at Wells Gray Park. I spoke to, if I can do a shout out to a lovely person named Ellen Ferguson, who she really went above and beyond. And she sent me reams and reams and reams of information on what they do within the park during the search and rescue, what type of helicopters they use, and just all this wonderful, wonderful detail that I was able to incorporate into the book. And, and the book wouldn't be half so good without her help. 
you can really tell that you've put in your research and I couldn't find any anachronisms, so big props there. <laughs> uh, also, on the theme of survival, did you have to do a lot of research about how to write the ways that Al and his teammates could survive such a severe plane crash and get over injuries and stay alive when there's not much food and when it's cold and stay motivated and ultimately be able to survive? And does it affect you writing such heavy subject matter? I did a lot of research on that because when you're working in a universe that's based in reality, to me, one of the things a writer really has to do is there's a uh, a quote from, I think the writer was Eudora Welty, who said, always make sure your sun is in the right part of the sky, essentially, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but make sure your research is right. And I didn't want to put something in there about survival. And ha all you need is one person who says, that's not how it really is. And you've blown it for them. And it's, it's really important not to blow the story for anyone if you can help it. Does it affect you writing such heavy subject matter? No, I would say not. There are those who would say most of my subject matter tends to be a little bit on the dark side. I kind of see it the opposite way. Most of what I write, I think, ultimately is about human triumph and how we overcome whether they're the demons that we carry inside of us or things from the outside affecting us, that I, I think we can triumph. And that's kind of what I focus on. Yeah, and you can't have any light without the darkness, can you? No, you cannot. They do balance each other out. And we see that again in Quantum Leap because Al and Sam are kind of both sides of that coin. This is more a Quantum Leap novel series in general question. Okay. In the TV series, it's pretty well established that it's Sam's body that leaps and he looks like the leapy because he's surrounded by their aura. But in just about all the novels that I've read which mention it, they pretty consistently show Sam's, or in this case, Al's consciousness as what ends up in the leapy's body. So when writing Search and Rescue, was this your interpretation of leaping or was it mandated by the editors so that it could be consistent with the novel series? I don't recall them mandating anything that I had to change. So I don't know whether I had, you know, it's so long ago now, I don't know whether I had a real clear idea of what happened. I do remember debating the issue with friends for the longest time, you know, is his body really there? What is going on? Because nobody seemed to really know for a while there. But I don't remember them basically giving me a quantum leap Bible and saying, you have to stick to this. But I, I do know that they've worked very hard to have consistency throughout everything. Even though it might not be consistent with the show, it's still really interesting to read about Sam or Al trying to come to terms with being in a different body and trying to adjust to not having the same abilities that they used to have. So it's still very enjoyable. <laughs> Absolutely. I can't even imagine what that would be like to wake up and, and look in the mirror and that's just not your face. Okay, well, moving on a little bit from Quantum Leap, what are some books that you absolutely love that may have inspired you to become a writer? Oh, I think the very first book that inspired me would be J.M. Barry's Peter Pan. That is probably the one book, no matter where I go and where I move and how many things I have to leave behind me, that book travels with me. What others... Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol is high on my list. That had a huge impact on me when I was very small. I bet you must have loved the fact that Quantum Leap did A Christmas Carol. Oh, absolutely. Everybody's done A Christmas Carol. It's such a wonderful, universal story. And it's again, it's that idea of redemption, that it doesn't matter how bad you are, you can be saved. And I, I think people want that in their lives, you know, especially when bad things are happening to them. But, you know, as far as other writers, uh, I read a lot of Stephen King because I just really, when when he's got a good turn of phrase, he, he can turn a phrase like nobody else can. I read a lot of Harlan Ellison, Jonathan Carroll, uh, Barbara Hambly is big. I read a lot of nonfiction in all kinds of topics, so pretty broad spectrum. Yeah, and the more you read, the more you know, so... Well, and the more you read, the better writer you become. The writers I meet or the people who want to become writers who say, well, I don't have time to read, I don't really understand that because that really is how you learn how to craft a beautiful sentence. Now, our fearless leader, Albie, is a massive Trekkie, and he'd kill me if I didn't ask you about your Star Trek <laughs> novels, Ice, Trap, and Shelf Game. 
So could you tell us a little bit about them and the writing process? Sure. Ice Trap came out of a collaborative effort with two other writers, Julia Eklar and Karen Rose Sircone. Julia had been contracted to write Kobayashi Maru, and after she did that, they asked her if she'd like to do a second one, and she, of course she was interested, but she asked if we could do it as a collaborative effort. And so that's how the three of us did it. We essentially sat down one day and hammered out the basic plot and how we would break it up chapter by chapter and decided who was going to write which characters and just basically took turns essentially writing a round robin story. Once they accepted that, they asked all of us if we were interested in doing more of them, and I submitted a proposal for Shell Game. It was approved. I wrote the novel, finished it about three hours under deadline, stayed up all night to finish it, <laughs> took it to Federal Express. I was there when they opened the door in the morning. I gave it to them, went home and collapsed. About a week later, I got a package back with this incredibly thick amount of paper that was all critique and notes. And essentially, I had to, in, in two weeks' time, I had to gut and rewrite the, the novel in two weeks. And it was a great experience for me. It was a little panicking initially, but it was an incredible learning experience because it helped me learn all about things like focusing a plot line and where am I going with this and making sense of out of a narrative. So they did me a huge favor in having me do that because they could have easily have turned it over to somebody else and said, you rewrite this. Or they could have said to me, you know what, we've changed our mind, give us our money back. So, Yeah, all feedback is good feedback in my opinion. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You, you know, it's it's just feedback is, is one person's opinion. You don't have to listen to it if it rings ill in your ear. But a lot of times there's at least a, a grain of truth to the feedback you get. Yeah, that's very true. And often if one person thinks that way, someone else will think that way as well. So... Exactly. The criteria I use when I'm writing is that if somebody complains about something I've put in a manuscript, I'll make note of that to see what else happens. And if I get four people complaining about the same thing, then I know it's definitely a problem and I need to address it. So what's it like writing for an established franchise like Star Trek or Quantum Leap as opposed to starting a new universe from scratch? Well, it's it's a lot of fun to be allowed to play in someone else's sandbox, especially if it's a fandom that you really enjoy. And they've done all the work for you, really. You've got your set of established characters, and you get to make some secondary characters, of course, but you've got your basic characters. You already know what they look like, what they're about, what their personality quirks are. You know the mechanics of the universe and how it works. So they do, in a great respect, take a lot of the work out of it for you, the other side of that is you are constrained in certain ways. You might want to go off and branch out in a direction and they kind of rein you back in and say, no, 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 that's not how this universe works. Yeah, and with Quantum Leap especially, they always go back to the status quo at the end of the episode so that you can continue with a brand new story next time. So Absolutely. that must be very restrictive too. They did an incredible, I mean, as far as the, the program goes, they did an incredible job and they they served as a beautiful example for any of the writers that came along i just i'm in awe of how they managed to do essentially a period piece every week yeah it was amazing and they really made it look authentic too yes they did very much so quantum leap was really unique too in the sense that they could tell a story about the past but from the point of view of someone who's living in present day and you could comment on how wrong some of those things were too Oh, yeah, definitely. And and you've got just that, it's that ability to, you know, here's, here's Sam leaping into the past, but he already knows about this past, a lot, of, you know, some of it anyway, and seeing, well, knowing about it in the future and actually experiencing it are often two different things. So that was fun to watch his attitudes and opinions change. Are there any franchises that you would have liked to write for but haven't had the chance yet? You know, if they ever decide to do a Game of Thrones franchise, I'm dying to be part of that. Oh, yes. But right, you know, I'm I'm doing so much of my own stuff now that it was a wonderful way for me to kind of cut my writing teeth, and I, I recommend doing it to everybody because it's a great way to learn. But anymore, I'm kind of focused on my own stuff. 
But yeah, all they have to do is say Game of Thrones and I'm there. <laughs> awesome. Well, speaking of your own stuff, you're currently writing some narrative nonfiction called The Man Who Loved Elephants. So could yes. you tell us a little bit about that, please? About 18 years ago, I was a volunteer at the Washington Park Zoo in Portland, Oregon, which is now called the Oregon Zoo. And during the short time I was there, I got to spend an evening essentially babysitting the matriarch of our elephant herd who had undergone surgery and needed to be under observation. And I worked that evening with the senior elephant keeper, Roger Hennius, and it was the most amazing four hours of my life. I learned so much in talking with him, and it just impacted me enormously. And for the 18 years, I've been thinking about that. And I wanted to write a short story about an elephant who has died and is waiting for her keeper to, to join her. And I decided to do a little research on how they keep elephants. I had no real information about the zoo, and it had been so long since I'd been there. And one thing led to another, and somebody put me in touch with Roger. And the more I talked to him, the more I realized that there was a far deeper story here than one little short story could hit. So I began interviewing him last February. We've talked at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, ever since then. And uh, we're now in the second draft of his story. Fantastic. So when do you think it might hit the shelves? Right now, I don't even have an agent for it, so I, that's impossible for me to say. I do have two small press publishers who have expressed an interest in it. I am hoping to shop it out to a few agents and see if I can get any nibbles there. So it would be nice to say next year, but it, if the way you know the publishing system goes now, if I'm lucky enough to sell it, it, it might be a couple of years down the line. It's hard to say. You've also written a blog, The Wild Ride, Caretaking Mom Through Alzheimer's. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that, just because it might help someone who's going through a similar experience? Well, the blog originally started out as just kind of my observations on everyday life, had nothing to do with Alzheimer's at all. And a couple of years ago, it's probably going on three years ago now, after my dad passed away, it became very clear that my mom could not live on her own. And so my husband and I decided to take her into our home. And Alzheimer's being the progressive disease that it is, you're kind of going along and you think, well, you know, they're, they're not doing too badly. Everything seems great. And all of a sudden the world drops out from under you. And it really is a roller coaster. You'll have really, really bad days. And then you've got days where if you look at them out of the corner of your eye, you'd swear that they were completely the way they used to be. So there was a lot of up and down, a lot of emotional stuff. And for me, writing has always been a way for me to stay sane and to put my world in perspective and to lay out my problems and maybe figure out a way to solve them. And I joined a support group, an Alzheimer's support group, and a woman who was a member suggested that Someone needed to start a blog. She didn't She didn't know I was blogging at the time. She said, somebody needs to start a blog to document this wild ride. And the little lights and bells went off in my head. And I went home and got my blog out and changed the name of it to The Wild Ride and just started writing about Alzheimer's. Because it's necessary for people to have an outlet. People try so hard to say, I've got to be patient all the time. I can't be angry. I can't express my real emotions. And, and you need to say, I'm angry. I'm hurt. I'm furious. I'm destitute. What, whatever emotions you're feeling, you need to get those out. And that's really what I was trying to do with that blog is to almost give other people permission to feel the pain that they were feeling. Where can our listeners go to read what you've written there? That is on WordPress. It's melissacrandall.wordpress.com. Great. Let's go back to Quantum Leap a little bit now. Do you know if Search and Rescue is going to be made available in ebook form? Oh, I have no idea. You're hired to write the story, and what happens with the story beyond the time that you turn the manuscript in, you don't really know about. So I have no idea what plans there might be for Search and Rescue at all. Well, let's hope they do at some point. I, I, I think if they get the sense that people really want it, you know, I, I don't want to start a letter writing campaign to, you know, the publishers or anything. But I, I think if if people make it known that, yeah, hey, we would like to have these, it could happen. 
Did you ever feel any extra pressure writing about what's become one of the most beloved series on the planet? Surprisingly, no, because at the time I did it, I don't want to say the fandom was small, but it was smaller than I think it is now, and it's become so vast. So I didn't really feel that pressure. I was writing for the sheer joy of playing with characters that I had come to love, so I, I didn't really feel that at all. And what's your favorite part or aspect of Quantum Leap? Oh, I think it's the human relationships. It's, it's really the relationship between Sam and Al. To me, everything that happens on that series comes back to that central relationship. Absolutely. And I'm really glad that after everything that Al did for Sam throughout the series, Sam finally helps Al get his um, happiness right at the very end. So. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I was thinking of that the other day and, and remembering watching the final leap and and you know i have only seen it once i watched it when it first aired and like a lot of fans i was absolutely furious by the by the end of it and i think i still am <laughs> i was like i i just think that sam could have done what he did for al and not have to sacrifice himself in the process yeah there are a lot of interpretations of that final episode and it was really cleverly written in such a way that People are still talking about it 25 years later. I, I prefer to think he's out there still leaping. But on the other hand, it's like, God, can you just let the poor guy go home? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's definitely a double-edged sword, isn't it? It really, really is. It was an extremely, it was a beautifully crafted script. It was beautifully acted. It had wonderful secondary characters. But it was just heartbreaking at the end. You know, when the, the final titles rolled you could hear this agonized psychic scream all across america with people going wait a minute <laughs> yeah uh have you written any other quantum leap stories or do you have any plans to write another and if so where would you have sam or possibly our leap to next i don't have any plans to do any more i did originally after I when I submitted the story proposal for Search and Rescue, I submitted five or six all at once, and Search and Rescue was the one that they chose. But there was one I really wanted to do that. Oh, I know you're asking me to remember back a long time, but I remember it had something to do with wolves, and I really wanted to put a kind of a, a thread of a query in there as to whether or not lycanthropy was real. But that's not the one they picked. <laughs> uh, well, uh, hopefully at some point they'll bring back Quantum Leap and bring back the series and we'll get to oh, hear everything else that lovely. you've got to say. <laughs> you know, the thing is, though, if they were going to bring it back, they'd probably want to cast all different actors. And I just can't imagine anybody but Dean Stockwell and Scott Bakula playing those parts. Do you have anything you'd like to say to your readers before we go? Keep reading. Keep enjoying. Let me know if there's something you'd like me to write. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Melissa. I had a fantastic time. Thank you for having me. This has been terrific. 